What up, guys? Welcome to the Work River Podcast. On this episode, we're going over an amendment that has been introduced to Ohio that would limit remote work. Stay tuned on the other side. All right, welcome to the Work Wherever Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about remote work, AI, automation, the ability to work wherever, so you can live every day like it is Saturday. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Thanks for all of you guys who have been listening. We've been uh, climbing up the charts, and I appreciate that. We do four different versions of the show here. We do the homegrown episodes. That's where my wife and I, it's a lifestyle podcast where we talk about the ability to uh, work remotely and homeschool. We do Hotspot. That's where Sydney and Destiny and I, we go through news articles. Courtney's been on a couple episodes. Haley's been on a couple episodes. Let's do more of a group podcast where we talk about trending news articles and how uh, what we think about them, right? How we think it's going to affect the remote work landscape. We do long-form interviews, which we haven't done one of those in a while, but we've got a couple of them on the docket for you guys. And then you guys get Roy's Rants, which are shorter episodes, which is what is today. Although today's kind of a blend because I am bringing in a article that has been sent to me I can't tell you how many times and the article is this um I've been sent it from multiple different news outlets the one that I have pulled up is from Fox and it is an amendment introduced to limit remote work in Ohio this is an amendment that would limit the workers. I'm reading straight from the article now. An amendment that would limit workers from working remotely in Ohio was recently proposed. The amendment is inside of the state's $94 billion budget, which was approved by the Ohio Senate during the week of June 12th. So this proposal, which is buried in the billion-dollar budget, which I've t- we've talked about this multiple times in the show, how the war on remote work and the the politicalization of working wherever really comes down to simple economics and how much money does a state have in order to spend and that they know that they can collect from taxes. And so if you take your populace, how many people are within your state, how many people work for the state, and in, in this instance, how much taxes you expect to obtain from your populace and how much you are spending on your people, you can come together on a budget. And if you are limiting the number of days remotely, then you're going to force those people to live within your state. If they're going to work for the state, then they got to live within the state, so says this bill. So let's keep reading here. If the measure survives, Ohioans that work for the state of Ohio would be limited. That's a key point to this is who work for the state. So it's not all businesses. But if the measure survives, survives, Ohioans that work for the state of Ohio would be limited to only eight hours remote work each week. That's one day. An exception would be for individuals that are granted it as an accommodation by the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, or any civil rights laws according to the 15-page highlights of the amendment. The Ohio rep the Ohio House of Representatives have yet to approve the amendment, which is needed before heading over to the governor, Mike DeWine's desk. The new budget must be approved before spending authority under the old budget expires, says Ohio, uh, the state of Ohio. Governor DeWine has to sign the budget by June 30th, which is less than a week away. So what do we got here? $94 billion budget in Ohio, and they have snuck in remote work, limiting to state employees only one day. Now, this is not actually the first state that we've seen this. It is the most recent state that is starting to get some publicity around this. Oregon did this. I think California has a couple policies. And so when I have seen this and when I've started to respond to this to people, my first instinct is this is a... How big is a state? How much, what kind of taxes do they have? How big is their budget type of issue to me? This is not a red blue issue. We've been over this before. The red, the Republicans, the Democrats, they are both anti remote right now for different reasons. The Democrats, as I had mentioned in previous episodes, I believe it's called the war, political wars on remote. Uh, It was published back in February. I recorded it back in November of last year, November of 2020. 
2022, I recorded it. It was published February 11th of 23, where I called it the political remote wars. And so that episode, I talk about why there is so much political landscape and so many so many policies going on. And I mentioned the economics, mostly around rebuilding cities. So I believe it was New York who reported a $14 billion loss from remote workers, or at least that's what they said, from people who left the state and then moved to surrounding states, whether it be uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, you know, Massachusetts, or just, you know, just left altogether. Maybe they moved down to, to Florida. There's a lot of New Yorkers in Florida, I'll tell you that. So maybe they just straight up and left. They Maybe they're not even in the tri-state region anymore of New York, and they're just, they just up and left. And so why does that matter? Well, as an employer who employs remote workers, while the majority of our workforce is in the Virginia, Washington, D.C. area, we do have members who do not live in the Washington, D.C. area. They're all still stateside. Don't worry, we are a fully American, USA-based organization. I have somebody who lives in Michigan. I have somebody who lives in Nevada. And I have somebody who lives in South Carolina. And I pay those states' state tax as the company. I have to register and enroll my organization with their state. I have to then uh, pay the state deductions to that state. Now, Otherwise, I still have to pay my business taxes with the county and state of Virginia that we are registered in. But when it comes to payroll, I am paying multiple different states taxes. So why is that a big deal? Well, organizations, at least from the organizations that I've seen, are pro-remote because they are able to offer it, one, as a benefit to their employees, so they're able to obtain and and uh, attract talent to say, hey, come work for me. We'll be You can work wherever you want, but also from a financial aspect. So it decreases their operational costs. You no longer have an office where people have to go to. You don't have to pay extremely high cost of living for those of you, maybe you're in a larger city. So like New York or Washington DC area where the wages are much, much higher, you can find oftentimes better talent for less. And you can do so by attracting talent from areas where maybe the median or higher earnings are a lot less than than where your business is founded. So you're cutting costs on the operational expenses and you're cutting costs on uh, payroll and human expenses. So for an organization, it's all good. And oh, by the way, your people are more productive, so you're getting more done and more out the door. And I, I, I... Overall, financials aside, I think it's the best business model because I think your employees are happier. That's the way we run it. It's been great. We've done both. We were an in-the-office organization. We went hybrid there for a little while, and then we just pulled the plug and went full remote. And it, we have not, we've increased our business uh, by a lot by going full remote. So it has been a huge benefit to us. That's the, that's the commercial side of it. Now, why do you care about the state of Ohio and if they're going to bring all their people back? Well, let me give you just a couple scenarios here. Let's say Ohio pushes this through and they say you only get one day a week. That's going to force people who work for the state, of course, to come back to the state and to work their hybrid scenario where they get once a week. That's good for the economy of Ohio. They get to keep their state money, the the taxpayer money stays in the state, and then they um, are able to uh, keep an eye on their employees or whatever. I don't know, whatever the other excuses are. Well, this is what we call a trendsetter. So Ohio did it. Okay, and then we're going to start to see other states start to do it. We're going to start to see some of the other states that are wanting to keep their tax dollars in the state. So I would assume California, they have high tax dollars, high taxes. They're not going to want to see those taxes go out of state because they've probably raised their taxes in order to pay for internal state uh, funding. So they're going to do it. Okay. So now if California does it, you're going to have to think that Nevada, Washington, Oregon, the surrounding areas of California would do it. Okay. Those are blue states. Ohio, hmm, 
they are a purple state. They could go red or blue. So that's why I don't think this is a red or blue issue. I think it is a state funding issue. So if we get into state funding, we're talking about the bigger states. So that means that potentially Texas, New York, Florida, some of these higher uh, higher spend, right? They need their tax money in order to uh, in order to do business. Now Texas or uh, Florida, rather, I brought up Florida and Arizona to a, to a friend, and he said, "Well, they don't have state income tax." And I was like, "Oh yeah, you're right." Well, at least at least Florida doesn't. I was like, "So so maybe Florida doesn't do it because if you don't have state income tax, then you're not really reliant on that income tax. You know, relying on that tax anyways." So maybe we don't see it there, but it's still to be seen. I do think that it, that that Florida will probably end up doing it, but there is the possibility that people that Florida could see an influx of people go, going and moving to Florida because there's no state income tax, and they're a friend of remote. You could see it both ways. When I was having this conversation with a friend, he brought that up because immediately my mind went to big state. They need money. They're going to keep people there. And he said, well, and he brought up that point. And I said, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. So maybe Florida is is one to keep an eye on. Here in Virginia, we are a remote friendly state. So I think we're the 13th largest state, something around that. So we're not really that big of a state. We're kind of in the middle. We are a purple state. We are a bit more business friendly under the current governor. So I do think that we would lean more towards remote. And we have been a more remote friendly state state. But let's talk about the trendsetter of Ohio. So those are the states that I could see doing it. But let's talk about the trendsetter. All the Ohio state employees are back. Let's say it becomes a trend for the for those states that I just mentioned, the bigger states, which, oh, by the way, Texas, California, New York, New Jersey, uh, Washington, D.C., because that would be the federal aspect of this. Florida, a lot of military bases around in those states. Okay. Military bases lends to a lot of state federal employees. So if the state and federal employees are coming back and they're forced to be in the office once a week, what do you think that their mindset on contractors who work on their contracts is going to be? Probably not very remote friendly. I can tell you right now, since 2020, they have been very friendly with remote work because that's how they've been getting things done. During the COVID era, they made it so a lot of the RFPs, RFQs, those are requests for proposals and re- requests for quotes that went out, did include full remote for contractors. So a contracting organization, whether they lived in the D.C. or the, the San Antonio or the Gold Coast or wherever they lived, it didn't matter. If they were supporting a contract, they could do it remotely. It didn't matter where they, where they lived. Now... If all the federal employees have to start going back, which is starting to become the case, by the way, more and more federal agencies are starting to to encourage their employees to come back. And this is one of the first budgetary uh, ones that we've seen amendments to be seen in Ohio. So that is written as law. Now, mind you, only for a year because they do these budgets every year. But if this becomes the structure, then it, be- it, it could enter into federal And so if all the federal employees have to go back, a lot of state employees have to go back, you're going to start to see the trend to be contractors who support the federal government who have to go back. These organizations, like mine, who support the federal government, are largely remote. So at least they have been over the last three years. So now you're saying, okay, the talent pool shrinks. So now I have to charge more to get localized talent because I'm no longer going to be able to use people who are... Uh, remote, so I have to replace some of these people. Now, a lot of these contracts were three and five year contracts awarded over the COVID area. So we're looking, we're talking about 24, 25, 26 years, that is uh, 2024, 2025, 2026, where I'm going to have to start looking at recompetes in order where the next time where they write these contract releases where they are not allowed remote or maybe it's a hybrid structure. So I have to change my organization now to target localized talent, which means my prices go up, which means my taxes change, which means my telework policies change for all of my employees, which means I become a more centralized organization. And now that favors who? It doesn't favor the small businesses like mine. It favors the big guys because the big guys who have multiple locations, 
like off the top of my head, I think Booz Allen, Deloitte, some of these organizations who are all over the place, they have already have these localized offices in, you know, Pax River here in Maryland, in Washington, D.C., in San Antonio, in Gold Coast, and all of the areas where these Navy bases are. So now it supports them because they already have the infrastructure in place to have members that are local to these bases and local to these federal uh, locations. So now you're cutting out more of the small business to provide business for the larger businesses, which, you know, maybe that is a, uh, maybe that's a play. Maybe there's a couple of shaking hands that are going on here to say, hey, if we force people back to the government, these government officials then will then stop releasing remote work uh, opportunities. And then from these remote work opportunities, this sounds silly, but stay with me here. When you release an RFI, RFP, RFQ, they release a lot of RFIs to see if a small business would even be able to service or support a contract. And if you make a contract non-remote saying there is no remote possibility on this, that limits a lot of small businesses, cuts them out immediately out of the equation. So then when you release an RFI, you say, hey, can any small businesses do that? Because they do have their small business set asides. And the small businesses say, well, yeah, I could do it if you made it remote. And they say, mm, nope, we have federal and state policies that say, no, 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 you can't do that. So it looks like we can choose whoever we want in this instance. And we're going to go with the big guys. Sorry, small businesses. Better luck on another one. Um, you know, Better luck next time. So it definitely favors large businesses here. It definitely favors the, the state budgets here. So this is all about money. So I could see some of the larger lobbyist firms, commercial, also lobbying for these, hey, a hybrid remote, limit the remote work, because that means more dollars in their pocket. They don't have to share with the small businesses of the federal government contracting agencies, which if you remember the, what was it called that... uh that Biden did, it was the infrastructure bill. A lot of money. Let me look up exactly how much the infrastructure bill was because the infrastructure bill was a ton of money. So that was, uh, it was released by by Biden. It was his like big, uh, big push. And it was a bipartisan bill. So let's see how much how much did it cost? It was uh, the bill invests 17 billion in part infrastructure, 25 billion into airports. So huge, huge dollars. Now, where do you think that money goes when you're talking about these billions of dollars? Uh, Biden signs the one trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill. So a trillion dollars. Where do you think that money is going? If you're buying infrastructure on roads, you're buying IT services, you're buying uh, fiber optics, you're buying bridges, you're buying uh, public transportation. This money does not go necessarily into the government. Sure, there's probably going to be a few different, you're hiring a couple of federal workers, a state employees and stuff like that to process some of this stuff for tracking. But a lot of this goes into contracting, which goes into the 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 big businesses I talk about. Deloitte, Booz Allen, um, our organization, you know, there, there's uh, uh Boeing, you know, a lot of these companies, uh, DXC, HPE, you know, EMC, Dell, Microsoft, AWS, you know, there are tons of organizations that are bigger businesses that are going to see that $1 trillion and share it out. So they obviously want that to happen. Their lobbyists are going to be pushing for these things because that means that they're going to get a bigger chunk of that $1 trillion. Now, that was just the infrastructure bill. We haven't even started having a conversation about the next couple bills to be introduced post this remote work uh, introduction. So let's say remote work is gone to only one day a week. The next bill that comes out is another trillion dollar uh, IT security or uh, whatever the next bill is uh, budget passed down by the federal or state go uh, governments. I, I, what did we say that this Ohio bill was? It was a certain amount of billions of dollars. So what percentage of that is going to go to only in-person work? Probably a pretty large percentage, probably like 90%. Because like I said, if the federal and state workers have to be there, you think they're going to be open to a, a proposal for a full remote contracting base? Probably not. I mean, maybe it might happen, but I would assume that they would be biased and leaning that they want their contractors to be on site too if they have to be on site. Which again... 
heavily favors the larger businesses, not the small businesses. So for two reasons, you get the two sides of here. Commercially would support if they're doing business with the federal government, which a lot of lobbyists are. That's why they are lobbyists is because they are wanting a piece of that pie or they're, or it directly affects their industry in some form or fashion and they want to make sure that they get their money returned or that, it, that it's working in their best interest. So that's why commercially they would want it because they think that they're going to get a bigger piece of the next $1 trillion bill that comes down the pike. Federally, they want it is because they want the income tax. They want those taxes that they're spending on their employees, that is state funded taxes, in order to keep that tax dollar money in the state so they can recycle it as part of the local economy. So you have it on both sides. And I've said this for, I don't know, eight months now, that this is not a Republican versus Democrat thing. This is all follow the dollars. If you can follow the dollars here, you're going to find exactly who wants remote work and who doesn't. And I will tell you right now, the smaller states are going to be the ones who don't care. They want people to flock because they want the money pushed into the local economy. These are going to be the beach towns, the warmer climates. That's why I'm still iffy on what Florida does, because a lot of people want to retire and go to Florida. And what if I could bump that retirement up a little earlier by doing remote work? I'd just move to Florida maybe 10, 15 years earlier so you get some of that income. Also, it probably would mean you'd see an in increase in money for the tourism at different times of the year because of remote work. We talked about leisure on this show. So New York, I'm still, or, or uh, Florida rather, I'm still a little iffy on what it is I think that they're going to do. New York is 1,000% sending people back. They're already releasing stuff that they took a $14 billion loss in blaming remote. So I have no question in saying that New York is going to be sending people back. Same with California. They are hurting hurting big time. In fact, that's why I think that you're seeing so many of these tech layoffs is because Silicon Valley, which is in California, they that's where a lot of technology happens. And so if California is putting pressure on these uh, technology firms to say, hey, keep your money, we want to keep the money in the state and we're only going to do business with people who are keeping their employees in the state, then we could see increased layoffs. I'm not saying that's why these layoffs are happening because I think that artificial intelligence, emerging technologies, a, a shift and a pivot in the way that organizations are being run, both te technological and internally, also plays a major role in this and the way that we've seen shifts from the hardware market to the software market. So it, it it's not just one thing. But it is people-related and money-related. And that's going to be the trend. How many people you got in the state? Which I've made mention of that before, as I thought that there were, I think, or I did, I still think, that there is going to be business incentives to organizations, much like we see HubZone organizations. So HubZone, for those of you who are new to the show, HubZone is a, a set aside by the state and federal governments where they can award you a contract if your business is 50% or greater done in a hub zone. A hub zone is a uh, economically disadvantaged area. So if you have a manufacturing company and your plant is in a area that is more uh, economically challenged, then you uh, get set asides by the state or federal government to for that award of that contract, thinking that that money is going to go back into that localized economy. Makes sense? Okay, so now we would we, I would assume we're going to see the same thing with people who have non-remote employees. So if you are an organization and you are whatever you want to call it, uh, hybrid zoned or whatever, where 50% of your workforce works in the area of where that money is to be spent, instead of spending a trillion dollars on infrastructure that then goes to different sides of the of the United States and not specific to where that bridge was being built or whatever it is. If you have state money and you're funding a bill or you're funding a road and that money is then going to a business outside of that state, that's not necessarily good for the localized economy, which I think is what's happening with this Ohio bill. So... I would assume that Ohio would then introduce something with their contractors to say, we're going to give bonuses or we're going to give set-asides or we're going to give whatever certifications for businesses who are Ohio businesses that have 50% of their workforce in Ohio and you guys are going to give special treatment for getting awarded certain contracts. Again, that's a thought. I've had that thought now for about eight to 10 months saying that this is the next wave. And that only gets introduced through measures like this coming out of Ohio to say, hey, Ohio, uh, we're going to send all the federal and state workers back. 
If you work for the state of Ohio, you got to come back. You get one day a week remote. And that's going to leave a sour taste of remote in their mouths. And so they are going to be more inclined to give their contractual work to businesses who are doing work in Ohio. That's the play. I'm sticking to it. I'm doubling down on this. So guys, something extremely important to watch over the next, I guess, I mean, we are near the end of June. So we're talking about within the week. So keep an eye on it. What do you think? Are you in favor of this? Are you against this? Are you with me on this trends? Hit, let me know in the comments below. Please like and subscribe. Thanks for supporting the show on all of the major platforms, iTunes, Spotify, uh, wherever your podcasts are found. We're also on YouTube now where you can watch me. Hi, guys. Uh, and then if you're on YouTube, hit us in the comments below. Let me know what you think. If you want to see uh, specific articles and trends, send them our way. Leave them in the comments and we'll, we'll do a show on them. That's what we've been doing. We've been getting a lot of DMs on Instagram. So thanks to all our new Instagram followers out there. Thanks to all the downloads. Yeah. Go work forever.com. Check us out. If you want to know more about artificial intelligence and automation, you can check us out there and get in contact with us. We'll go over, uh, we'll do a consultation with you, see where you're at. All right. Well, until next time, guys, thanks for hanging out. See you. Hey there. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications for all the latest videos from Capital Presence.